states the rules for our new government, one of them being that we would have a president, not a king. <laughs> I guess I should introduce myself. I'm George Washington. I'm best known for being commander-in-chief during the Revolutionary War, for becoming the first president of the United States, and for being the man on the one dollar bill that you probably used to buy your coffee from Starbucks this morning. <laughs> Today I will tell you what I believe was the turning point of the American Revolution. Us colonists were losing the war, and we knew it. After our loss in the Battle of Long Island, I was starting to feel depressed and discouraged about our chances of winning. But I kept fighting, because I needed to believe that there was still hope. I needed to demonstrate to my troops that we could carry on. Soon the French allied with our forces and arrived with more men, food, and weapons. I was ex I needed, wait. It felt like a weight had, had been lifted off my shoulders. Merci beaucoup. With more manpower and strength, I was then filled with a newfound determination to take the British troops down. As my troops, the French soldiers and I strongly marched toward Yorktown, Virginia on October 17, 1781, anxiety started to build up inside of me. We had won the last couple of battles and I was excited and hopeful, but I also felt incredibly nervous. I was shaking in my boots. This war was dragging on and on. It seemed like it would never end. So many people were relying on me. George Washington to bring victory for the Americans. Here's where it gets really interesting. I made a plan to surround the British soldiers at Yorktown, three sides with troops on land and one side with French ships in the water. Our opponents were trapped. We started fighting and that's when I realized that the British were outnumbered in men and weapons. I was ecstatic. Maybe we could finally have a victory for America. This might be the night that we patriots could officially win the freedom that we deserve. We surrounded the British troops and kept them trapped until eventually we saw a white handkerchief being waved high in the sky. A sign of surrender. General Cornwallis, the British commander, was not happy, but eventually he admitted his defeat. We all celebrated with joy. We had won our independence. Take that, King George. You will be forever labeled as the king who lost America. Now I'm off to see how this architect carved my face into Mount Rushmore. I heard that the first go around was a bit disproportionate. God bless America. Thus did a game of marble save me from a life of servitude. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you patriots there. I should probably introduce myself. My name is James Ford. I was born on September 2nd, 1766 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I was born as a free African-American. My dad was a sailmaker, so he taught me how to make sails, and I became a sailor myself. Let me tell you about my story. When the colonists signed the Declaration of Independence, I heard it read for the first time in Philadelphia. 
I was so inspired that I decided to join the Continental Navy because I wanted to help fight for the freedom of America. I was on a ship called the Royal Lewis when it got captured by a British ship called the Amphion. My fellow American sailors and I were taken prisoner in the Amphion, and I ended up traveling on that ship for over six months. As luck would have it, I wound up becoming best friends with Captain Baisley's son, Henry, because we both liked to play marbles. At one point, they even asked me if I wanted to return to England with them. I told them I couldn't because I was devoted to the cause of their American independence. I was eventually freed from the British ship at the end of the war and returned to Philadelphia to see my family. After the Revolutionary War, I decided to follow my father's footsteps as a sailmaker and eventually became one of the most successful businessmen in Philadelphia. I continued to fight for their freedom throughout my life, helping the fight to end slavery in our new country, America. To this day, I keep these marbles with me to remind me of my great fortune. Long live American independence! <laughs> of when I fought in the Revolutionary War. On May 20th, 1782, I enlisted in the Continental Army as a soldier. After I signed my name, I felt a bit self-conscious and timid to speak around other soldiers. It was a very new situation for me. Over time, I got more confident and comfortable in my new position. In one battle against the Tories in Boston, I was unfortunately shot in the leg during the battle and also injured my neck. I was forced to go to the hospital, but I really just wanted some time to be alone. The doctor came in and left some medicine and bandages for him to use later. But who really trusts doctors, right? <laughs> How much more than us can they really know? Once he left the room, I removed the bullet with my pocket knife. So painful, but I had no choice. I knew I had to summon all of my courage to go back and join the fighting. Back with the army, I thought I was in the clear, but in June of 1783, I caught a fever and was sent to a hospital again. Since I faked him twice, Dr. Binney had to examine me and discovered that I was a woman posing as a man in the Continental Army. From what I know, Dr. Rainey kept my secret safe, which relieved me very much. On October 25, 1783, I was released from the Army after serving only a year and a half. So I guess I should introduce myself again. My name is Deborah Sampson, undercover soldier in the Continental Army. As strong and determined as any of the men I was fighting with to bring independence to America. One lesson I have for you. Believe in yourself and be true to yourself. Women can do anything they put their minds to. Long live American independence. The redcoats are coming. The redcoats are coming. Hi, I'm Paul Revere. You may know me from my time as a spy or from the Sons of Liberty but I'm here to tell you about my midnight ride. This is how my ride started. On April 18th, 1775, I found out that the British troops were coming to Boston by boat. I knew this meant trouble for the colonies, so I jumped on my horse, Brown Beauty, and started riding to Lexington. You see, I had become sort of a messenger for the colonies by that time, so I was a really fast horse rider, and I was good at snooping around and finding out information about the British. My first stop on that famous night was to put two lanterns on the Old North Church in Boston. This told everyone that the British attack was coming by sea. Then, I started warning people by ringing on doorbells and waiting for someone to answer the door, and then telling them the news. As I was riding, I got caught by 12 British soldiers, and I couldn't believe my bad luck. They told me, if you attempt to run, we'll blow your brains out. So... I really had no choice. I had to dismount my horse and I took good old brown beauty away from me. I had to walk all the way to Lexington by foot. Thankfully, I was not alone on that night. I was with William Dawes working to warn everyone of the coming <coughs> British troops. So that's about it in my midnight ride. It was quite a night. 
I never did get my horse back, but it was worth the one the minute men that the British were coming. God bless America. <laughs> as he grew, fearing his strength that she and Diane knew. She laid some taxes on her darling son and would have laid another after on. Amend your manners, all the taxes moves. Oh, I was just going through some old poetry I wrote. It's crazy to remember what Britain put us through as stamp pack. Seems so long ago now. Forgive me, I have forgotten my manners. I haven't even introduced myself. My name is Phyllis Wheatley, and this is how my story started. I was only seven years old when I was captured from West Africa and brought to Boston Harbor as an enslaved person. When I got off the boat, it was so loud and so disorienting. It was so different from the home I had known. I was purchased by Susan and John Wheatley, and they named me Phyllis after the boat I had traveled on. Over the next few weeks, I got more and more comfortable in Boston, and I began to learn so much more from my surroundings. Susan Wheatley began to teach me how to read and write from Bibles and other books. And eventually, I even learned Greek and Latin. I loved learning, and I realized I had a unique talent for writing poems. I started to write about what was happening around me. People were becoming so frustrated with British, and we knew a war was coming soon. As the fighting started, I had admired and honored George Washington for his leadership and bravery. So I decided to write a poem to him entitled, To His Excellency General Washington. I waited and waited for his reply until on February 28, 1776, he wrote me back and addressed me as Miss. It is said that is the first time he has addressed a slave in that way. Sure hope that sets the trend for his future behavior, but I may never know. I met, later that year, he invited me to his house in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It was a delight. Thank you for listening to my story. I did my part in showing America the limitless talents and abilities that African Americans bring to this new country. Farewell. I'm off to finish my latest book of poems. Oh, I finished my chores. Now I can ride my horse star whom I train myself. Oh wait, I forgot to introduce myself. I am Sybil Lovington. You may not have heard of me, but I am the female part of you. My ride was successful, and I didn't get caught. Even though I knew how to make candles, butter, and so none of these tasks would have prepared me for what happened on the night. On a rainy April night in 1777, a messenger came from my father, Colonel Luddington, and this is where it all started. The messenger told my father, The British are burning Danbury! The British are burning Danbury! The messenger was too tired to deliver the message, so I proposed I go instead to call my father's soldiers to action. My mother didn't want me to go because of the danger, but she finally gave in, and I departed on a cold and rainy night on Star. I saw many creatures on my way to warn the neighbors, such as owls and deer. I was scared and tired. In the cold rain, my body was aching but I didn't give up on the idea of America. I didn't stop at every house because neighbors would arouse their neighbors to help me do the job. People were gathered, gathered at the village green cheering Star and me on our journey. <laughs> on my way home, I saw an orange glow. It was a Danbury fire. The British were burning warehouses that contained food and clothing for the American soldiers. But because of my ride, General Washington's soldiers joined my father's soldiers to help fight the British. My ride changed the course of the Revolutionary War and American history. God bless America.
When I got older, I met John Adams in the year 1759. But it was not love at first sight. I thought he was overweight, too short, and talked too much. <laughs> Over the next few years, though, I got to know him better, and I discovered that we had a lot in common. He had a great sense of humor, and I liked that he had a lot of ambition. When we got married, we lived in a farmhouse in Braintree, Massachusetts. I became a mother of four beautiful children, which kept me very busy on the farm. So now that you know a little bit about my past, let me tell you why I was important to the American Revolution. You've probably heard my husband, John Adams, because he was very active in forming a government in our new country. But people don't really know that I was important during the time as well. While John was away, I needed to keep in touch with him, and I let him know how things were going at home. There were over 1,000 letters. It was while John was away in Philadelphia the Battle of Lexington and Concord happened. I should have been scared since the vet was only 20 miles away from my house, but I was too busy to worry. The American soldiers were training in my yard, and I helped them by melting pewter <coughs> utensils to make musket balls. I sent a letter to John telling him that one could hardly imagine how we're living here, back at home, how difficult the conditions were. John actually shared this letter with the Continental Congress, and my words helped those men understand the danger we were living in and push them to action. Overall, I was important to America because while my husband was working in politics, I was also helping behind the scenes and giving him important advice. I may also have been ahead of my times when I urged my husband to remember the ladies. I was reminding John to understand the important role of women like me today and every day. <laughs> and I am proud of it. I was born on a plantation in Virginia in 1736 and, and was very spirited as a kid. I liked to cause mayhem and chaos. I eventually grew up to become a lawyer and an active member of Virginia's House of Burgesses. Now let me tell you the story of the Second Virginia Convention. The timing wasn't great at the start. My wife died in 1775 and soon after I had to hurry off to the convention. Even though I was still grieving over my life, I was anxious to see what the next events would bring. I thought we should go to war with Britain, and when it was my turn to speak, I made sure all the people knew. Here comes my first famous quote. There is no longer any more room for hope. If we wish to be free, we must fight. The meeting went on. Some people still wanted to settle it peacefully. After that was said, I kept pushing on. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. I ended by punching an imaginary dagger into my heart. My speech was very effective. I know that because after we decided to prepare for war, each colony was going to need a militia, so I volunteered to be the leader of Virginia's. Thomas Jefferson and I planned the rest. By the way, guess what their shirts are? Over to your deck. My words. No. <laughs> if you want one, I'm auctioning off. <laughs> in the end, if it had not had if it had not been for me and my encouraging words, we might not have decided to go to war and become a free country. Besides, I think one's word can be one's most powerful weapon. Good day. <laughs> Much.
Hi, my beloved fans. My name, of course, is John Hancock. You all look so lovely this morning, as do I, of course. I'm sure you already know who I am. Most people do. Yes, yes, I was the first person to sign the Declaration of Independence. I was kind of a big deal in my time. And almost everyone loves me, but I'll get to that later. Today I'm here to tell you about that famous day I signed the Declaration of Independence. Now, let me get started. You need to understand, things were not going so well in the colonies. So many taxes. I wasn't making anywhere near as much money as I should have been. We were having a meeting to decide how to get to that poor, sad, selfish man, King George. In 1775, everyone chose me to be the first pre to be the president of the Second Continental Congress because I was King George's number one enemy, and I was on his dangerous American list. Can you believe that poor thing? He was so confused. If America won the war, I would be honored as the first signer of independence. But if America lost the war, King George would surely have me hanged for treason. Did that make me hide my name? No way! On August 2nd, 1776, I signed first with my beautiful signature, and I made sure it was big enough that King George could read it from across the pond. After all, I was making history. After signing the Declaration of Independence, I was eventually elected as the first governor of Massachusetts. I can't blame them. I am a very good fit for governor. You are very welcome for sharing with you the tale of the most famous signature in all of history. Farewell. I'm off to throw my best party yet. And the best part is that you're all invited. Huzzah! Huzzah! <laughs> Revolution, I was connected by nature, friendship, and every other social tie with many of the first patriots and most influential characters on the continent. I had the best means of information. Can you guess who I am? I am Mercy Otis Warren. You may not have heard of me before, so let me tell you more about my story. I grew up with the benefit of a good education, which is not always the case for young girls at the time, and I love to read and write. My father believed strongly that girls should be able to do the same things as boys, and he also had many other strong political views. Later on, my husband and I lived in Plymouth, where life was mostly quiet, but nearby in Boston, Samuel Adams and the Sons of Liberty were raising a ruckus. <laughs> <laughs> they rioted the streets to oppose the, great, the unfair taxes being imposed by Great Britain. Then the unthinkable happened. My brother, Jemmy, who was, a, who was a hot-headed and an outspoken opponent of the British, was savagely beaten by our enemies. To fight back, me and my friends boycotted British goods and provided for ourselves by making our own thread and linen. I also started to write political essays that, and plays that began appearing in Boston's newspapers. I wrote anonymously. And I didn't sign my work. Just look at what happened to Jemmy. Plus, many people wouldn't respect a woman writer. A few of my most trusted friends, like John and Abigail Adams, knew my secret. Though, one of my well-known works was called The Squabble of the Sea Nymphs, which told the story of the Boston Tea Party from, a Greek, from Greek mythology. Last but not least, when I was 77 years old, I proudly signed my name on a life's work, the history of the rise, progress, and termination of the American Revolution, which is over a thousand pages long. <laughs> I'm so glad I got to tell you my story, just in time to as I got to head to my conference with Raina Telgemeier, you know, one of those new authors. Good day and God bless America. <laughs> Did you see the news? General Washington was poisoned. At 
actually, you never did see this news thanks to me. <laughs> My name is B. Francis. Listen closely as I tell you the story of how I saved George Washington's life. I was just 13 years old, and I lived with my dad, Samuel Francis, in New York. He owns the Queen's Head Tavern, and many famous people, including General Washington, like to go there. People think of a tavern as a safe place to talk, so they'll meet there and have secret or private conversations. One day, my dad told me that he heard someone saying, General Washington was in danger of being killed. My dad knew he needed to take action, and he had a plan. I would go and work as a maid in George Washington's house. My real job, however, was to be a spy and make sure George Washington stayed safe. All my dad knew was that the name of the person plotting to heal the general started with a T. So I disguised myself as a maid, got busy making beds, washing dishes, cleaning the house, and most importantly, paying close attention to who was around <coughs> General Washington, especially for the names. One day, Mr. Hickey, General Washington's bodyguard, gave me some peas to make for dinner. While I was cooking the dinner, he oddly came down to the kitchen and asked me which was his play and which was General Washington's. After I told him, I quickly saw his hand flash back from General Washington's play into his pocket. I became suspicious and nervously took the plates upstairs. As I was serving everyone their plates, George Washington said, Thank you, Mr. Thomas Hickey, for getting my favorite June peas for dinner. That's when I clicked in my head. Mr. Hickey was tea. I grabbed General Washington's plate away and threw his peas outside where the chickens started eating them. They immediately died. I knew Mr. Hickey had tried to poison George Washington, and I called my father. Mr. Hickey was convicted of attempt murder and executed as a traitor. Thanks to my father's clues and my work as a spy, George Washington survived and led us to independence. Even a 13-year-old girl can make a big impact. Now I'm headed back to work at my father's tavern. It's renamed after our family, the Francis Tavern. Come visit sometime. We're at the corner of Pearl and Broad Street downtown. I highly recommend the tavern burger with a side of truffle fries. See you soon. <laughs> lives and help win the battle of Mom. But you probably don't know who I am, so let me tell you my story. When I was 20, I was a maid for the Irvine family. I helped cook, clean, and take care of their children. Later that year, I married William Hayes, and soon after, he joined the Continental Army. During the war, I had nothing to do, so I followed the troops and did laundry in their wounded soldiers. During the fall of 1777, we lost battles at Brandywine Creek and Germantown in Pennsylvania. We decided to go into New Jersey for the long and harsh winter, hoping things would get better. And they did. In spring, the French joined the war, and the German officer helped train the American soldiers. Soon we would be ready for the battle at Monmouth. On June 28, 1777, 78, we caught up with a large British force and we began to fight. Everything was going fine until the temperature ro rose. Soldiers were collapsing because of the heat. I knew I had to do something, so I grabbed a pitcher I saw lying on the ground and ran it over to a spring. I gave it to fallen soldiers and kept the cannon school. The soldiers were saying, Molly, Molly Pitcher. Molly was a name used to refer to women when their name was unknown. It's like saying Mr. or ma'am. I was trying to help as many soldiers as I could. Suddenly, I realized my husband had fallen and was wounded. So I decided, he was the one firing the cannon, so I decided I needed to take, to take over for him. I fired so many cannons that day, it is said you can still find cannonballs buried in the ground today. Without the help of strong women like me, the Americans would not have been able to win as many battles in the war. Thank you for listening to my story. Anyways, I'm going to go celebrate my 280th birthday. I mean, my 20th. <laughs> Hi, my name is Samuel Adams. You might know me from the popular beer. <laughs> <laughs>
importantly, I organized the Sun Celebrity and led a famous protest. Since I'm here, I will tell you the story of the Boston Tea Party. First, when I found out that King George III was putting taxes on tea, I was angry. <laughs> King George was trying to get us to buy British tea by selling it at a lower price, but he kept the taxes on it. As long as he kept those taxes, we were not going to buy that tea. But the Sun Celebrity, a group, uh, um, on, on December 16, 1773, ships were planning to unload in the Boston Harbor. With the Sun Celebrity, a group I organized to protest unfair taxes, sent an angry letter banning the tea from being unloaded. The second, the, um, unfortunately, the governor refused our demands, so we sent another letter. The second time, the governor didn't answer. So that's when I said, this meeting can do nothing more to save this country. Time to take action. The Central Liberty and, and I disguised ourselves as Mohawk Native Americans, boarded those, in, boarded those boats in a Boston Harbor and dumped 342 chests of tea right into the water. What a party. <laughs> well, that's the end of my tale. And now you know I'm not just a port because of my beer. I was always fun at a party, especially the Boston Tea Party. God bless America. Hello, my name is Patience Level Wright, and I grew up in New Jersey. I'm going to tell you about how I became a revolutionary spy. I was born a Quaker, and I became a very talented artist and sculptor. When my husband died, he didn't leave me any money, so I traveled to Philadelphia to live with my sister, Rachel Wells. We ended up opening our own business where we made wax sculptures of people, anyone who wanted them, and could pay the money. We befriended Jane Mecca, Benjamin Franklin's sister, and she persuaded us to open a business in England where Benjamin Franklin was representing the colony. I had heard so many things about England growing up and how brilliant it was there, so I decided to see for myself. I set sail for England in 1772. When I got there, Benjamin Franklin told many wealthy Englishmen about my arrival. And pretty soon, my business in England took off. I was so successful that I was invited to Buckingham Palace to create wax sculptures of the king and queen. In Quaker tradition, we treat all people equally. So I just called the King George and his wife Charlotte. Actually, I called George Farrell behind his back. <laughs> when I sculpted, I debated the colonies with George. The colonists just started revolting, and I saw a brilliant opportunity, secrets. All I had to do to collect these secrets was offer false information to the British. Then they were gullible enough to correct it, revealing their deepest, darkest secrets, the numbers of troops, cannons, and military supplies that Britain was planning to send. They named the colonists taking bribes from the British and shared that Britain was planning to starve the colonies by cutting off trade. Not all of my information was correct, though, because Britain suspected me of passing secrets, so they purposely gave me false information. Most of it was true. Once I collected my information, I wrote the secrets on slips of paper and stuffed them into wax busts that were to be shipped to Rachel back in the colonies. When Rachel received a bust, she would have to stick her hand inside of it to mount it on the body. This way, only she would discover the messages. After discovering the secrets, she would tell members of the Continental Congress or military leaders, and so that was my time to spy. Undoubtedly, America wouldn't have won so many battles if it wasn't for me. Hopefully, American freedom will last forever. Sadly, wax won't. God bless America. on January 1st, 1752. I owned my own upholstery shop, a rare thing for women in that day. I was married three times. All right, John, John, and Joseph. Oops, got carried away. I better introduce myself. I better get started. You'll be wondering how I came to make the blind. Silence your cell phones and put away your sewing materials, please. Okay, let's begin. Back in 1773, my husband 
My first husband, John Ross, and I lived in Philly. We were friends with the big GW. <laughs> and he often called on me when he needed shirts for the army. Not to brag, but I was an excellent seamstress. Don't get me wrong, I was proud I was making a difference. Women don't always get to help, but I felt like I should be doing more. One June day, I was sitting in my shop sewing when I heard a knock on the door. When I opened it, I expected another customer, but instead I found my husband's uncle, Robert Morris, and General Washington there. At first, I wondered if I wanted a living room chair set. Instead, the general asked me to make an official flag. I said yes! George showed me the design, and my first thought was that George had clearly never been to sewing school. The stars had six points for crying out loud! <laughs> the committee thought six-pointed stars would be easier, but I showed them other ones. I also made sure the flag waved in the wind. I couldn't have a flag being stiff as cardboard. My husband's uncle provided the money and materials needed, so I got to work right away. Finally, on June 14th, flag day, I finished. I brought it into the committee, and it was unanimous. Everyone thought my flag was the, the best. Was there ever any doubt? My flag was now the country's flag. I felt ecstatic and proud. Betsy's upholstery shop became Betsy's Flag Emporium. <laughs> I'm still making flags. Look me up. However, it wasn't just a flag I was creating. It was hope. The flag helped everyone feel unified and secure. It inspired people who were unsure to become patriots. So the Br British eventually got wind of what I was doing and began calling me a rebel. Without me, America wouldn't have been a country. Now, I must get moving. Elizabeth Grimscon Ross, a.k.a. me, has tickets to Hamilton. <laughs> Good day, and God bless America. surrender at Yorktown and the horrible victory for the Americans. Okay, let me get started. We were doing really well in the war until 1780 and 1781, aka my worst years. Suddenly the tides of war started to change and the Americans were starting to win. But we could not surrender. But then we did surrender. <laughs> The Battle of Yorktown, October 1781, also known as the Last Battle, also known as the Worst Battle. Anyways, General Convoz, my British general, surrendered after the Americans fired 35,000 shots at our troops. He was completely overpowered by the French and American soldiers. How could he have let this happen, though? If I had been there, I never would have let them get away with this. One month later, I was in my palace when I found out the news. Text messages took a lot longer to be delivered back in the day. Bad service. Well, anyways, I felt betrayed and angry at Kamal's, and I had to, but I had to do something fast so I could make a big comeback. I had an idea, but then the darn parliament said it was too expensive. They were not wrong. We were already in a lot of debt. Then the next thing you know, everybody's saying the Americans had won. I refuse to accept this. What did you expect? For me to be happy for them? Well, yeah. <laughs> I, after I realized how many soldiers had died and debt we had, I said I wouldn't blame it on myself because it was truly not my fault. America is better with me because if I was not there, the 13 colonies would be way less organized. Also, I financially supported those colonies. I just wanted to create more land for the colonists to expand west. Then they hated on me. I felt mistreated, but you Americans started the war, not me. Now my label is the king who lost America. Well, now you've heard my story, aka the real story. 
Farewell, everyone. I have to pick up my 15 kids from school. Now you can clap. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.